I'm going to be talking today about uh, analysis of uh, an instability in stratified fluid flow. Um, most of everything that I'll talk about today uh, is uh, joint work in some sense or the other, um, mostly with uh, Harvey Seeger and uh, Bernard de Koenig. Um, but we'll be using results uh, and building off ideas that uh, other individuals have been doing for the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, I want to first preface this entire talk by saying, start this. Uh, I want to preface uh, this entire talk by saying that um, when I'm going to be talking about uh, analysis of instability, what I really want to talk about is how I would analyze uh, an instability, uh, which is to say I want to highlight some uh, interesting developments in the analysis of partial differential equations in the last 30 years. Um, uh, disclaimer, I'm not going to be presenting any results. The problem I'm going to be considering is going to be motivated from uh, uh, buoyancy-driven flows, but the results are there in an abstract sense, not for this particular problem. Um, and, and the focus really is, here are some interesting developments, and I would love to talk to individuals after this about interesting physical problems that we could apply these tools to. Okay, so um, I'm going to be assuming a two-dimensional viscous incompressible fluid, um, and we've been talking about this in the summer school a lot, uh, and many people have mentioned it in the discussion meeting so far, which is we'll be considering the Boussinesque form of the equations. So this is what uh, they look like. Um, I haven't non-dimensionalized. I apologize. Um, largely, the parameters are not going to play a role in the sense that we're not going to specify to this. It's the structure of the equations that I'm most interested in. And in that sense, the numbers per se are not that relevant. Um, the physical scenario that I want to consider, aside from the fact that I'm going to consider a linear density profile, so linear, uh, you know, typical Boussinesque sort of situation, what I want to consider is a, uh, a situation where uh, the fluid is bounded by two uh, walls, uh, two, uh, two plates, and the top plate, let's say, is moving with some constant velocity. So you could summarize the whole thing as stratified couette flow. Okay, so it's density stratification, couette. Um, and uh, I have viscosity, so that's how it's different from your case. Um, which uh, I also want to point out, since I have viscosity, that's why I need to consider a linear profile. I'm not considering arbitrary profiles yet. Um, all right, so that's the setup. Uh, so as I said, there's an exact solution, which is the Couette flow solution, right? So a linear velocity profile satisfies this nonlinear set of equations if the velocity in the horizontal direction only depends on the z variable, which we'll take to be the vertical variable. Uh, we've got the momentum equation in the horizontal direction, momentum equation in the vertical direction, incompressibility, and the equation for density. Uh, N is, uh, as many people have mentioned today, the brunt wassler frequency, which is the slope of the mean uh, density profile. Okay, so that's... Uh, a set of equations. We want to do linear stability analysis, so we will linearize about this uh, steady state flow. Uh, tilde variables are my perturbation variables, um, and what I'm going to introduce is a stream function so that uh, u tilde and w tilde are given by uh, these uh, derivatives of the stream function, and then because the whole problem is now linearized and all coefficients are independent of x, I'll take a Fourier transform, right? So K represents the Fourier mode, and uh, the resulting set of equations, rather complicated looking, but that's what you end up with. So the capital U over here is the profile that's linear in Z, uh, and uh, U naught over H represents some, like the slope of that mean profile, H being the thickness between the two plates. Um, so in terms of uh, equations, what we have is an equation, the, this is the horizontal momentum, vertical momentum, and rho. Right, so uh, a standard thing to do is to consider something that's kind of like an Orr-Sommerfeld equation, where you eliminate the pressure, effectively. So it's kind of like taking uh, a curl of the momentum equations. When you eliminate the pressure, you end up with this following uh, differential equation, uh, PDE for the Fourier transform of the stream function. Um, if this term is not there, it just looks like typical Couette flow. 
it's this density term that's coupling with the density equation uh, that's uh, giving this uh, coupled uh, system, right? So what do people usually do? Uh, people usually want to uh, study linear stability analysis. It's not too hard to proceed um, in, in principle. You just separate uh, the time dependence by assuming an exponential, um, and then you end up having to crank out an eigenvalue problem. Now, uh, multiple people have known about an issue with the eigenvalue uh, analysis, uh, which is that the associated operator you get is not normal. Um, a normal operator is something that commutes with its adjoint. The nice thing about normal operators is you can conclude stability from their eigenvalues. So uh, non-normal operators have this behavior where they can have short time algebraic growth. Um, this is uh, something that a number of people have been worried about. And um, one of the reasons why is, of course, you can't conclude anything necessarily from just the eigenvalue analysis. Um, I don't want to get into whether or not non, uh, non, uh, the non-normality is essential for a stability, but it's certainly a mathematical fact. And so one would like a way to handle this, um, irrespective of how important it is, just to actually eventually build a framework where we can actually ask the question, is this relevant? Right? So we would like tools that actually handle non-normality. Um, the other thing that, oh, yes. Uh, off the top of my head, I, I, I can't say. For no slip, I believe it is not, it's not a normal operator. That's the calculation that I have checked. Um, it, it gets into, if you have shear, it'll be, um, it's about the operator. And so the operator includes the boundary conditions. So when you specify an operator, you have to specify the boundary conditions. And I, I personally have only done the calculation or no slip, uh, my guess is that is, it is probably non-normal in all cases. Um, we'll come to actually, at some point we might actually see precisely how, why I suspect it's always non-normal. Um, now the, the, the classic calculation of this eigenvalue problem initially for uh, plain Poisley flow was done by Orzag in 1970 odd something in JFM. Um, and you know, even the numerical analysis is a little tricky. He used this spectral Chebyshev uh, method. You, you, you have to be really careful about how you implement uh, the slip boundary conditions. When you're doing things without boundaries, things are much easier. With, uh, with no slip uh, and, and at a wall, it's, it's a little more delicate. I mean, he eventually did solve the problem, so he tells you how to get, get over these things, but they, they are. Uh, aspects of the problem you need to worry about, and they are directly correlated with the non-normality of the operator as well. Okay. Um, all right, so here is an outline of my talk. Uh, I'd like to make progress as much as I can without resorting to numerics just yet. I really want to push uh, the formulation of the problem and the theory and the mathematical analysis as much as possible and eventually end up with something that maybe I'll do numerics on. Um, it's going to be in three steps, uh, reformulate the problem, simplify the problem, analyze the problem, okay? Uh, these steps are in increasing order of technical detail. I'll probably be spending most of my time uh, reformulating the whole problem. Uh, then I'll talk about a little bit about how to focus on the essential part of the problem. And then the last part will be a very brief summary of a whole uh, literature that lets you analyze these kind of operators. Um, so I do want to point out that the original, th this idea for the reformulation uh, is due to Harvey Seeger. Um, initially when uh, he and I were working together on a separate uh, boundary value problem and he suggested this reformulation, I resisted it quite a bit. Uh, I was pretty conservative in my attitude at the time and I think I'm uh, a recent convert. I think it's a better way of looking at this problem. All right, so uh, another disclaimer, uh, as I said earlier in the talk, this is about the structure of the equations and tools available for those structures. I will not actually tell you when things are unstable. Um, I apologize for that. The original goal for me was to 
uh, actually have this problem done, but most of the analysis was done for a completely different stability problem. And then I wanted to give uh, a talk on buoyancy driven fluid flows. So then I came up with this problem. So uh, unfortunately the full details specific to this case, uh, I haven't worked out, but the, the abstract theorem does hold. All right, so uh, let's recall that we tried to uh, linearize the fluid flow. We introduced a uh, function psi, the stream function, and took Fourier transforms, and we ended up with these set of equations, where the first one is the horizontal momentum, vertical momentum, density equation. Previously, we eliminated the pressure by uh, effectively taking a curl of these uh, first two equations. You take a z derivative of the top, you multiply the second by i k, and you subtract the two. Uh, alternatively, you can recognize uh, something, which is that the two momentum equations are actually equivalent if, and only if, the pressure satisfies a Poisson equation, right? So this is uh, what you would end up with. Um, there's a term from the shear flow, and there's a term due to the uh, density variations. Uh, so if we suppose this to be a, a legitimate equation in our system, um, and we reintroduce W, the Fourier transform of the vertical velocity, just so that I don't have an extra factor IK floating around, um, you end up with uh, the following stipulation where now this P hat is actually given by the Poisson equation. Right? So instead of dealing with the, uh, uh, well, the, in some sense, what you want to think about it is the first two equations are actually evolution equations for the same quantity, but they're two different PDEs. That can only be okay and kosher if these two PDEs are somehow effectively the same. And what you could uh, realize is uh, if you take a Z derivative of the lower one, stipulate P hat satisfies this, the upper one is true by default. So what that means is we can reduce our complexity by just considering a formulation of uh, W, P hat, and rho. And that's what I'm stating here. So let's remind ourselves that there's a background flow. U is given as a linear profile. We have boundary conditions. This comes from uh, the, uh, yeah, so this is no normal flow. This is no tangential flow. The, the Z derivative of W will be zero. This comes from the divergence relation. Okay. Um, and then I'll state that the density fluctuations at the two uh, ends are zero. And so I end up with this system of equations. I have an evolution equation for W, P is given in terms of W and rho, and I have an evolution equation for rho, okay? So at this point, it's a combined uh, elliptic parabolic equation. Let's make some more uh, progress. And this is the essential idea of Harvey Seeger, which was to first note that there are no boundary conditions for the pressure. Nonetheless, We'll march forward and say, it's just a second order ODE. I know how to write down the solution using variation of parameters. Let me just write down that solution with two arbitrary constants. Now, there are constants with respect to Z, but they should actually depend on time. Right? So what you have is a representation of the pressure that is unspecified because the pressure doesn't have boundary conditions. But this is a perfectly legitimate and more importantly, true statement for some capital A and some capital B. So I'll just go ahead and plug this uh, uh, expression into my equation for W, effectively reducing the dimension to just two equations, a W and a row. And the important thing to realize is A and B should actually be treated as legitimate unknowns. They are not functions to be specified. They are functions obtained from the boundary conditions, they are part of the system of unknowns. So if you actually count your unknowns, it's W hat, rho hat, A and B. They're all unknowns. So somehow all of that information has to come out. Okay? Um, think about this, uh, I mean, in a very loose analogy, it's like having a free boundary value problem and then the interface itself is one of the unknowns and values at the interface can be unknowns. That's exactly what this is. A and B are effectively defined by the pressure, which is an unknown on the boundary, and has to be deduced from the solution. Okay, 
Uh, so that's just me plugging this in and getting this glorious mess at this point. And my claim is we've actually done something uh, quite convenient for a further mathematical analysis. Um, so the first thing to do is uh, just throw away the entire right-hand side. That looks complicated, just forget about it. All you have is the left-hand side. That is a very easy differential equation to solve. Right? So w hat t just goes like this, rho hat t just goes like that. It's not even a PDE if you throw away the right-hand side. It's an ODE in time parametrized by z, which is a very easy equation to solve. And that's kind of convenient that we have this particular structure. The other thing I want to point out is in this particular case of Kuwait flow, the only explicit variable coefficient dependence is actually this shear flow term on the left-hand side. The entire right-hand side actually doesn't have an explicit z dependence. Even though there's this convolution kernel coming from the, uh, um, from the variation of parameter solution, it actually corresponds to a constant coefficient solution in a, in a funny way in that the Fourier transform of it can be taken. You can still take a Fourier transform of this in Z, for instance, and write this as a product of, uh, of two Fourier transforms of Fourier transform of G and Fourier transform of this. Yes? Two dimensional. I was, I was, uh, all of this, I, all of these ideas, yes. Things from here, maybe not. Um, there's certain things that I haven't shown that they extend nicely. But up to this point, this idea is really saying, if you have an analytic expression for the pressure, which we do, I can invert the Laplacian in, in uh, higher dimensions. Yes, it has a, a convolution kernel. I can use the free space Laplacian in two space dimensions to get that. Um, all right, so as I said, the left-hand side actually looks like a really easy equation. And we'll see later on that if we didn't have the left-hand side part, this shear stress term, this, uh, the shear flow term, the right-hand side is also an easy equation to solve. Separately, they're really easy equations to solve. What we now want to know is how do you combine them? Okay. Why this is an easy equation, I'll come to later. All right. So to clean things up, and it's always good to introduce notation to clean things up, your evolution of equation just looks like this. I say just, but L is a, is a pretty nasty monster. That's why I just hit it with L for now to focus on this fact that this has a very nice diagonal structure. Right. Um, by the way, you can actually note that the evolution equation that you would get just by considering this diagonal term is actually a unitary operator. It's really nice. It's time reversible and whatnot. Um, all right. so. When faced with difficult problems, make them easier by considering something completely different. So let's just consider a toy problem which is morally the same. Q is a scalar quantity and satisfies this differential equation where L is some operator. For argument's sake, just think of the second derivative. Right? It also has the same property, that it has a diagonal term here. It's a one by one matrix, so it's a lot easier. Um, if you read Cato's book on perturbation theory of linear operators, he tells you, if you knew the eigenvalues of L, he could tell you the eigenvalues of uh, the combination. Uh, usually, he needs to stick an epsilon parameter here to make it work. Um, but if you think about this a little more and just first compute this energy integral, so what you do is multiply this by Q star, the complex conjugate, uh, uh, and then add the complex conjugate of the whole equation, uh, you can get this integral of Q squared is just the real part of this expression. And this is where the fact that F was a real valued function multiplied by I is really useful. Because if I multiply this quantity by a Q star and add its complex conjugate, it vanishes. Right? And that's a very nice property to have because effectively the growth rate of the solution is actually decided by the L equation, not by f of x. So this was uh, a nice uh, uh, thing to say because at this point, if I just analyze L, how big it can get, or if I analyze this quantity, I can basically deduce stability without having to worry about what f is. And f could be any uh, 
bounded continuous function, and this idea works. Uh, another thing you can do is rewrite this energy integral in a more suggestive manner. Um, what you basically do is divide by uh, this integral itself, so you get a logarithmic derivative, and then you rearrange some terms, and you end up with this expression. So uh, the energy itself is equal to the initial energy times this exponential. And uh, this term in magenta uh, that I've highlighted is a property of the operator L and is called the uh, numerical range. Okay, so you define the numerical range as phi star L phi, this quadratic form uh, for all phi on the unit sphere, and you put all of those in a, uh, in a set. Uh, anything that's an eigenvalue of an operator falls into the set called the numerical range. But there are things that are not eigenvalues as well. Um, the numerical range has a really nice property that the sum of the numerical range of two operators is contained in the, sorry, the numerical range of the sum is contained in the sum of the numerical range. So it plays nicely with uh, perturbations, which means the numerical range of this entire right-hand side is the numerical range of the first operator plus the numerical range of the second operator, or at least it's contained within. Uh, from the second statement, the eigenvalues of p plus q are all in the, uh, the numerical range, uh, in this set, add the numerical range of p add the numerical range of q. So it's another way to estimate all the eigenvalues as well using these first two uh, statements. You can make another statement. As I said, the numerical range is of an operator L is just a property of the operator. If, that, if this quantity, real part of the numerical range is negative, q is asymptotically stable. Um, you can make other estimates. Basically, if you find the uh, largest value that or just real part that this thing can take, you can get a bound for all time. Uh, basically, this number m, which is the supremum of the real part of the numerical range, uh, lets you estimate uh, the possible algebraic growth if you knew that all the eigenvalues were stable. So here's a, here's a plan. Somehow find the eigenvalues of L explicitly. Use perturbation theory to bound how far they can go when you add an f to the operator. If they're all still stable, just look at the supremum of uh, numerical part of the, the real part of the numerical uh, range of L, and from that immediately it follows a very simple statement um, that you've got the largest power in T that the solution could ever grow. So you have an estimate as to how bad things can get. Um, some further analysis also tells you at what point that bound breaks, and you might as well just use the long time behavior of the uh, eigenvalues. So it seems to be that when you introduce this new formulation in terms of the, when the pressure is given explicitly as a convolution kernel, you expose yourself to a whole bunch of results that are now available to estimate these things. Um, so I said all of these details for uh, the scalar problem case, and I said, uh, morally speaking, the problem we have is effectively the system version of the scalar problem case. You have to do a little more work to show that everything still holds, but by and large, it's all, uh, it all falls out fairly straightforward. Uh, in some sense, the, the, the growth rate of the total energy is effectively decided by the operator L, not by this part. In some sense, all this can do is rotate your solution about the unit sphere. It can't actually take you to a larger sphere. Okay, so at this point, uh, I'll wrap up with a few statements about why this problem, when I dropped uh, the dependence on the shear flow, why this problem is actually relatively straightforward now, um, about five years ago, not so much. Um, so this is a system of equations that I said uh, we would like to analyze as much as possible. And the claim is this problem can actually be solved explicitly for any initial condition. It is a boundary value problem, but it can actually be solved explicitly. Uh, the idea is to use this technique called the unified transform method. Um, here are a couple of statements about the unified transform method. Basically, it's good and really useful and can be used specifically for Self and non-self-adjoint problems. So um, 
why do I have a non-sulfur joint operator? One way to think about it is, if you just looked at these two terms, this looks like a sulfur joint operator with appropriate boundary conditions. But I said A, B are also parts of the solution. It's this forcing term that basically says you're not going to have a sulfur joint operator. If you look at the associated adjoint, they're actually defined on different spaces. So since they're defined on different spaces, they can't ever be sulfur joint. There are two operators defined on two different spaces. Um, but nonetheless, we can perfectly analyze this. Moreover, um, very recently, we, uh, uh, Bernard and I and a couple of others extended, I just need a, another minute or two, um, extended this method, uh, which was initially developed only for scalar PDEs. We extended it to systems of equations, including non-local operators such as this. So this is an integral operator, so we've, we were able to analyze those things. So we were able to develop this new machinery to handle precisely these type of equations. And the solution has explicit x and t dependence and has show, uh, tells you where the initial condition should go as well. Um, the integrals are given in terms of complex integrals in the, in the complex plane, but that's actually kind of beneficial because now you can do deformations. And then once you've put deformations, you can pick up residues. And when you pick up residues, as it turns out, wherever delta is zero in the complex plane, you end up picking up an eigenfunction. And the eigenvalues are precisely omega, the dispersion relation, evaluated at that point. And so you can actually compute all the eigenvalues. You can uh, do uh, large time, small time asymptotics using steepest descent, stationary phase, your favorite method. Uh, you can make assumptions on where Q is zero, non-zero, different classes of initial conditions to get different types of rate, uh, growth rates, decay rates, so on and so forth. Um, if I actually write this down, the actual solution, none of you will be convinced this is a good idea. But in principle, it's actually very easy to compute. It's just that when you actually write it down, it's more than, you know, more than a page long. I mean, these are messy looking expressions, but they have explicit x and t dependence, which means you can take rays in the xt plane and do steepest descent and say, what is the solution looking in this direction? What is the solution if I go at a particular speed? It's actually much more convenient uh, in this fashion. Um, and so the, just to wrap up, what we've been doing for the last year or so is actually developing an abstract framework to analyze fluid problems in two dimensions with shear in rectangular domains. And all of them look like some operator equation of this form, where s hat is the set of fluid variables of relevance. So it could be a vector, as in our case, or it could be a scalar in some cases, like plain postulate flow, it would just be a scalar. Uh, all of them have this particular form of a diagonal term that is a, a real uh, function times an imaginary unit, uh, some, uh, a compact operator, and an operator that is amenable to uh, the unified transform method. And what we've been able to show is that just by understanding this, you can understand the full operator by a sequence of arguments, either using uh, perturbation uh, theory or these ideas about numerical range, bounding uh, certain integrals, so on and so forth. There are tedious details, but it's interesting to know that it can be done. Uh, and I'd like to close with the fact that the kind of problem that actually inspired us was a two fluid two viscosities, two densities, interface problem with um, a shear flow that actually depends on time in both fluids. So that's the actual problem we would like to uh, consider where this guy actually depends on time, this guy will also depend on time, but it turns out you can actually get estimates as to how things can grow, so on and so forth. So that's actually where, why we built this extraordinary machinery. As it turns out, it's also useful for a whole class of problems, in particular, uh, stratified coet flow. Um, that brings me to an end. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's basically just a uh, very simple estimates in using standard analysis techniques. You put uh, an absolute value on this whole thing. Um, in some sense, what you're looking for is uh, what omega j, the dispersion relation, as a function of k, where it takes its maximum real part. Um, on this contour. So basically, bound yourself away from all the poles, 
put an absolute value and say, well, that's an initial condition that you give me, which has unit norm, and I'm just looking for this e to the minus omega j of t, it's the dispersion relation that will tell you what m is. The dispersion relation will depend on things like rho naught, g, capital N, kappa, mu, plug in all of those numbers, and so capital M will be a function of the physical variables. So there's a whole space to explore that, you know, I don't want to get into right now, and that's really why I haven't finished this problem, because it's, it's a huge parameter space for me to explore what capital M is in different regimes. But basically, it's just the dispersion relation, plus an epsilon to account for the fact that there are other things that I've thrown away, but it's basically that. And if you keep the earlier structure, you can still decompose it into a normal plus a non-normal system, right? Sorry? Uh, if you stick to the earlier structure yeah. uh, with just the velocities and the density, you can still write it as a normal matrix plus the non-normal component as an extra L times. That's right. That's right. So the same thing can still be... So uh, the unified transform method can actually work for those type of problems that look like a linearization or the right part of the original or Sommerfeld equation, but I don't get to use this numerical range trick. So I don't see this uh, thing that is just an imaginary unit times a real number. That part gets distributed between both terms. And so that's the one difference that I can see. My guess is in principle, because it works this way and there is a transformation to the other problem, that problem is technically doable, but it might be easier this way. Um, but don't take my word for that. Any more question? If not, let's thank.